Well, my calendar tells me it's a Wednesday. It's face to faces time. Delighted to see an old mate, Max Dupreer, who's sitting, I think, in the Simonstown area of Cape Town. Am I right? I'm in Simonstown. So you have a lot better views than I do in Joburg. Nice to see you yeah. again. So <laughs> you, you are, are you still a journalist, author, political uh, analyst, still doing all that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm writing a book. I'm writing two books at the moment. Uh, one on the patterns of land ownership over the last 400 years. And the other one, uh, 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 a next installment of my popular series of, of popular history books. Um, I publish a newspaper online called Um And I'm... Uh, I give advice to corporates on uh, what all the political developments mean. Well, that's, that's probably how you and I reconnected after, oh, a long time ago. So let's, last night, our president gave the latest of his addresses, collectively bearing his addresses in mind. How's he, how's he rating on your scorecard? I'm going to be uh, gushing about our president, and then I will have to qualify a lot after that. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think um, the old saying of cometh the hour, cometh the man is true of Cyril. Um, this crisis um, suited his style of consulting, talking to everybody, um, reaching consensus, and that's what we criticized him for in the last two years, because he didn't make firm decisions. He didn't move. He kept on talking and trying to keep everybody inside the tent. Well, with this, with this uh, crisis, uh, it had to be done. You know, so his first move was get all the political parties together and have a press conference with, with John Steenhuis and, 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 and Julius Malema and, and, and Terry Lakota and Bonto Olomisa which is exactly what you wanted. When you want buy-in from the people, uh, because that's crucial. And he went to the faith communities, he went to the business community. So that was good. What he then did, which we only discovered a little bit later, is something that few other heads of state had done. Certainly not Mr. Donald Trump. He took the best scientific minds of South Africa and put them in a committee. People like uh, Salim Abdul Karim, uh, Linda Gray. Uh, and, and it's astonishing the talent we have in South Africa. I mean, I, I have a lot of connections with journalists all over the world. And they are in awe. Uh, and they write about the scientific know-how in South Africa and how we've done that. And unlike Thabo Mbeki, and surely unlike Jacob Zuma, Cyril Ramaphosa listens to the science. Uh, he's been following the science. So I think his public addresses have been good, it's been reassuring, um, uh, clear. And he got, he got us into a lockdown early enough. Uh, and it shows in places like Germany and Korea, you know, that helps. So it's all good. And that's where I put the full stop. Because now we've been talking about Cyril Ramaphosa, his health minister, William Kieser, who's also been very um, impressive, being a medical doctor and all. And then there's the rest of his cabinet. And then we have, may I say, buffoons like Becky Tele, who also come as the hour, come as the man. He's a mini Idi Amin with his hat on, shouting things, saying illegal things like, you sell liquor in your spaza shop, we will not only take your liquor, we will destroy your infrastructure, we will destroy your shop. It's a criminal offense. I mean, so then you have uh, Madam Revolutionary, Lindivis Zulu, who suddenly thought she should be in camouflage revolutionary gear. Um, and it, it's completely ridiculous. And, and I say, you know, it's okay, wear what you want if you do your job. Has she done her job? No. What we've known over the last few days is food parcels are getting hijacked by ANC councillors. 
And that is Lindiwe's Zulu's job. She is social security minister. She should feed the poor. Well, here in Cape Town, not far from me in Makassar, across the bay, they looted uh, stores yesterday because they haven't eaten in two weeks, because the state never arrived. Um, and then you have Fakile Mbalula, the Minister of Transport, who just thinks this is a free-for-all, and in one day he says, no taxis, okay, no then, okay, no, no, 100% uh, capacity, no, 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 let's go to 70%, as, as if it's for him to decide. Then you have Nkosazana Glamini Zuma, who I think she's, she's kind of impressed me a little bit over the last two years. Uh, because she's just kept quiet and done her job. But now we again see the true face. She thinks it's up to her to decide on behalf of 57 million people what we should and shouldn't do without explanation, just making, getting up in the morning and deciding um, no more cooked food. I mean, how Insanity. How absolutely ridiculous. So we're sitting with the president and an advisory council, people like uh, Abdul Karim, and they're very reassuring. And then you get to what you then need is a capable state to do all the stuff. And we do not have one. We're seeing the ANC for what it really was. And, and you know, that, that was once my political home. As people would know, I come... My only political party that I ever associated with was the UDF in the 80s. So I'm not coming from some right-wing angle. I've known, I've been going to Lusaka since 82. I knew all these guys personally then. And I must say, uh, I'm deeply, deeply disappointed and shocked to see that those, those old liberation movement um, instincts uh, that we saw in the camps in Angola and in Zambia uh, and elsewhere, that they're all coming back. They're all coming back. Uh, I remember Jomudise, and this is a story that I worked on so I can vouch for it. This is the absolute truth. Jomudise was the head of Mkonto Isizwe. He loved dressing up. He, in the 80s, sent a, a, a posse of Mkonto Isizwe soldiers into South Africa from, from, Ango, from Zambia to go all the way to Johannesburg to infiltrate, to buy him a pair of shoes and buy the shoes and then exfiltrate, go back. Um, and we're seeing that part of the ANC again. So is that a, is that a, is that a shortcoming of Cyril's? Should he be saying, uh -uh. firstly, before you make a pronouncement, run it past me or run it past whoever, and then she'll yeah. be saying, you know, cigarettes. Well, we know what's gone wrong with that. You try and stop a smoker smoking, whether he wants to or not, he's going to smoke. He'll find his cigarettes and we'll lose all that benefit. Is, or yeah. is, he, is he terrified about what happens when this is over and that he, wants, he still wants everyone on his side come the ANC? Yeah. yeah? It's a little bit of that. It's a little bit of that. I think he's, he's also saying, I'm, I'm the big picture guy. I'm the president here. I mean, I'll let my, my shock troops do the work on the ground, but, but I'm a big picture. I'll, I'll do the 500 billion rand uh, economic sort of interventions and talk to the nation. Uh, but I think that stem, so he's not a hands-on micromanager, but he needs to be at, at this point. Or Zwelli Makize needs to be. And then why don't they stop Bekele saying these things? Why don't they stop um, Kosozana Dlamini Zuma's madness? Um, it, it's down to exactly what you're saying. This faction fighting inside, like waiting, Eismacher Schule, the CEO of the party, sits there waiting to pounce to see if Cyril is going to make. So, any kind of grievance that he can pick up, he will amplify. And he's ably assisted by the EFF. And so Cyril's old weakness is still with us. He is scared of confrontation. Maybe not scared. He's decided that confrontation will not get him reelected for a second term. 
And I've got news for him. Um, all that stuff is gone. Yesterday is gone. We're talking about a whole, if, if we are two months away from the worst of this pandemic in South Africa, then we are going to see uh, mass burials. We are going to see thousands of people dying every week. We are going to see people um, looting stores. We're going to have some instability. Well, then normal politics don't apply anymore. Um, and he says last night in his very nice little address to us that everything has changed. South Africa won't be the same. But has he, has he worked through that? Uh, and I, my advice would be to say, come on, guys. The entire society, the entire economy is on its head. We're going to do things differently now, and we're going to do them my way. And if you want to oppose me, you, I will expose you during this crisis as undermining the people. Um, we get to SAA, for instance. I mean, what everybody watching this would say, isn't there a mo the, the most obvious thing that not only should SAA have been canned a long time ago, but surely not. I mean, we can't feed our people, but we want to fly the elite somewhere and it costs us 10 billion, it's gonna cost us 10 billion this year. So it's pretty obvious. And yet I saw again this morning, EFF and these RET faction people saying, well, yeah, yeah he's, gonna give, he's gonna give the flying rights to all the rich white people. And I thought, okay, it's the ideal opportunity. Just cut it down, just shut it down. But no, the SAA is not going to die. It is now going to be reborn as a smaller outfit. Um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know why people can't understand how big a moment this is in the history of humanity. Are they, are they gonna get rid of Praveen? There's a lot of rumors swirling. No, the rumors have been swirling from the beginning. Um, he is so crucial. He is so crucial to the whole Ramaphosa. I, 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 I totally get that. But in the end, and you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his, does, but does the whole SAA and SEO, particularly SAA, the other SEOs, um, SOEs, do they, do they fall firmly on his shoulder? Or is he just part of that process? And you, you know, you can't, you can't just suddenly lock the front door and walk out. Yeah, I think it's it's one of the weak things, the weak spots of uh, of of Bravin's defence. Because let's face it, I mean, he's an old mate of mine. He is a man of huge integrity. He is the hardest worker. He's a humble guy. He drives around in an old uh, Corolla. He doesn't have bodyguards. I mean, that's the kind of politician that we all want. But he is an old communist. Those instincts are still there. Um, the old socialist instincts. The only guy without that, really, two guys, are Tito um, and Cyril. And the rest of them, Ibrahim Patel, Tulas Mnesi, um, all those guys are all still the, 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 the old socialist orthodoxy is still sort of dominating the brains. So um, I think Praveen knows um, that SAA should go. But we need, they all believe in a developmental state. And they've all bought into the Chinese model where state-owned enterprises drove the developmental state. And I think in theory that works. If you follow the example of China, China, this is really their model, but China has closed down thousands of state owned enterprises when they turned out to be ineffective or corrupt or not needed. And, and so if we do that and say, we're gonna have three or four or five of these things, um, but we will treat them as businesses like the Chinese do, then it can work. But so there's, a, there's muddled economic thinking. And I think, uh, Stuart, this is one of the problems that we're seeing now. You cannot have a 100-member National Executive Committee of the ANC 
govern the economy. There are people on there that I know who would not, if I asked them today, what does GDP stand for? They wouldn't know. They wouldn't know. And they're good people. Otherwise, they are living with their communities and they're leaders in their communities, but they know sweet all about the economy. Why do we ask them to determine the economic policy of this government? So what are we going to do from tomorrow to roll out Cyril's new massive plans? Because do we have anybody who can physically take his instruction and make it work? Because best plans in the world. Yeah. Yeah, listen, and, and, and I must say, I'm, I'm impressed with the plan, the 500 billion plan. On paper, I think it's bold, it's ambitious, and I think that's exactly what is needed. It's 10% of our GDP, more or less, which is what we lost, and I think that's a good model to use. And I've spoken to some people um, in, in the UK, uh, UK and, and, and in Berlin this morning, and they like the idea, they like what he's doing. But it's as you say, uh, it's will it be implemented and quickly without people just sticking their hands into the cookie jar all over again? I think most, most of the stuff is down to Treasury, which is the only department that really, really works in our society. So I think the economic stuff could work when it comes to feeding people or supporting small and medium enterprises. I think we we'll probably lose half that money to inefficiency and corruption, which is totally depressing. Our state is simply not strong enough to handle this crisis properly. And I think that's the biggest point and one that I'm going to leave you on, even though it's depressing. Tell me, is that a parrot in the background? It is a parrot in the background. It's your name parrot. is Picasso. Picasso. It is my parrot. Picasso. And he's been shouting, where's Picasso? Because he can't see me. I put him out on the balcony. Well, it's, a, it's a good thing he hasn't learned some of those choice words that parrots are famous for. Oh, he has. He has. He has. He has. <laughs> Let me just, uh, before we say goodbye, yes. say, say this. Um, because we talked each other into a depression now. And I don't, you know, I've been around for a while. I've been a journalist for more than 40 years. My, the first prime minister that I interviewed was John Foster. I mean, some people who watch this won't even remember who he was. I went through the whole John Foster, P.W. Bursa era all the way. I've seen this country um, in deep trouble and utterly divided and us getting nervous about a total breakdown and civil war and racial war. Um, and all that tells me we are going into very dangerous terrain. But we're probably going to pull through. We're probably going to pull through. Because our private sector, our professional class, so strong, so strong. And you look at the Solidarity Fund and people there, top people, man, they can walk into any place in the world and they would be in the cream. And, and there's this gap between that and the state and the civil service. But that's who we are. So I think we, we're going to pull through. I, I'm not, uh, I'm a bit nervous, but I'm not desperately pessimistic that five years from now we will live in Venezuela or Zimbabwe. But, uh, but it's going to look pretty different around here. We're going to have to have a stronger state. We're going to have to have national health insurance, something which two months ago I would have said to you is lunacy. And most of us said, we can't afford that. Well, we were wrong. Maybe, maybe that's the first thing we need to do. Uh, I think America's realizing the same. So I think I see so much goodwill among people. Just around the corner from me in Hot Bay, the, the mostly white community, it's like giving millions and millions and millions and feeding that entire Imizama year to squatter camp. Um, and so it brings out the worst in some, but it brings out the best in many others. And uh, we're still going to be around. Just stay free of the, you know, people you're my age, just stay free of, of the virus for a while. Um, but the rest of us will have to get it. Um, let's just be honest. 
60, 70, 80 percent of South Africa will have to get this virus and survive it because we're going to probably wait 18 months, two years for, for a vaccine and it might not work. So long haul, but also, you know, an exciting time. Max Dupria, thanks for the bad news and the good. And lovely to see you again and we'll talk to you soon online or on a stage somewhere. I'd love to. Thanks a lot, man. Have a Thank good you. day. Cheers.